Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Erin McClune. She is from EasyNet. You probably saw her ads on the website. We thank her for helping sponsor the podcast. And we're actually talking today about something a little bit different. Might sound a little bit not great, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised when we're all done. So we're talking death positivity today. So thanks for joining me, Erin. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Jennifer. It's nice to be here. Erin is the one that suggested this topic, and I've had a little bit of time to look into it, but not as much as I would have liked. So let's just begin (laughs) with, you know, life gets in the way. It's very frustrating. (laughs) Oh, I completely understand. It just seems like we're all going about a million trillion miles a minute anymore. There are some Uh, weeks and it's like, I know you bounce from one Zoom meeting to another and it's insane. Life is just crazy. So, (laughs) but that's kind of what death positivity relates to. So can you explain? Yeah, that's the one thing I did did manage to catch. (laughs) (laughs) So what exactly is death positivity? You know, death positivity is not too different from... Uh, body positivity or, you know, even sex positivity, right? Where if you understand that there's all kinds of different approaches that, you know, it's, it's kind of accepting, hey, death is a natural part of our lives, which we all know instinctually, we know that logically, but when you <laughs> when you start thinking about death, there's also that fear that comes along with it for many of us. And, and so it's just starting to understand, okay, well, if we look at death as this natural part of life, what it really does is it frees us up to live our lives more fully while we're here. Sounds good. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) After, after the last year we've all lived through more than a year, I think yeah. we need as much fullness as we can achieve. And and I need a little more bo- body positivity in my life too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I went on a huge weight loss journey uh, more years ago than I can remember now. I think it's been mm-hmm. a decade now. Holy Toledo. She's, time flies. Yeah. And that's an amazing experience when you lose a ton of weight because what's in your mind isn't what you're seeing in the mirror. And then you have experiences that reinforce that the mirror is correct. If your brain is wrong. And that's, that's just really fascinating. So I learned a long time ago, I think having been over a hundred pounds overweight is that our bodies are really pretty fascinating vessels for lack of a better term, you know, especially for some of us, you know, we've created an entire life. You know, we've created beautiful things to give to the world or maybe not necessarily beautiful, but maybe technology that's kept us together in the last, you know, year and a half. It's, it's, that's the way I try to look at it. It's like, okay, yeah, physically, I might not look like a swimsuit model, but that's okay. I'm I'm only five foot two. I'm not going to be a swimsuit model, no matter how much I try to change the shape of my body. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and, and I think the whole idea behind body positivity is helping your brain understand that you are beautiful in the shape that you are and go live your life. Right. And so when we translate that to death positivity, similarly, it's, Hey, yes, we are all going to die someday and that's okay. And again, freeing us up to really live our own lives to the fullest There's, um, seems to be a cultural belief that death is somehow a failure, which (laughs) is really, you know, it's like, I don't know if that's a reliance on the medical profession or not really sure how we got to fighting death at all costs, even when you've got somebody who's not able to live life fully and not able, you know, somebody with Alzheimer's or somebody that's got end stage cancer or whatever awfulness sometimes happens to people. And I, I always lived, well, I still live my life, but when my mom was still around, I did everything I could to give her as much quality and fullness as possible. And I 
kept telling myself, I will not do anything that extends this, this dying process of Alzheimer's. And I didn't. <laughs> and I told my husband and my daughter, if, if the situation arose, like I'd always said, if she got pneumonia, I would call hospice. And I yeah. said, you, you two might have to stand on either side of me and hold me up while we go call hospice or whatever. Like, do not let me back down because I knew my mom would hate the way she was living and she would, she was terrified of getting Alzheimer's and she did. So it's, you know, I, it's a difficult balance to know, you know, are we just giving up or are we accepting that? We all, none of us gets out of this life alive, which many listeners have heard me say. That's what my maternal grandfather always said. Yeah. Well, and, and you think about how we treat our pets, right? That we care for and love and cherish, right? And somehow we're more comfortable being okay with, with them passing at a time that's right for them and not, and not prolonging it. And yet, you know, these loved ones that we care about so deeply, our moms, our dads, you know, the, these people that are so important in our lives and we're like, no, no, don't go yet. And, and, it you is. know, I, I think there are times that they drag on past a, a natural point. Oh, I fully agree with that. And having gone through having to put down the most loving, cherishing, devoted, crazy stalker shadow dog of mine last year. And and I knew it was the right thing to do. It just we had a whole week of, you know, just total hell. He was in hell. We were in hell. You know, one week of that was more than enough. And it was like, and I looked at my husband I'm like, this is so hard. Can you imagine doing this? To my mother or you know my grandparents or whatever so yeah it's it's a topic i like to touch on because i really i am i've always felt that we should have um the death with dying option mm -hmm. death with dignity option i think i said that wrong but i also understand that you know with humans it's a real slippery slope like really steep slippery slope <laughs> <laughs> like really super steep all of a sudden you're crashing down into you know i mean how do you if you've got somebody like my mom who couldn't take care of herself couldn't make her own decisions i'm just supposed to be like well it's time to go to the uh dr night night guy <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> you know whatever we want to call it it's like oh, it's time to take you to dr death mm, yeah, I don't, yeah our society and is way not ready for that I think part of that is is having those conversations, right? And and if you do come from a position of death positivity where it's like, okay, it's okay to talk about this stuff. It's okay to have these conversations, right? Then you your loved ones know what you want. It's not you've you've had a chance to kind of plan for it and and set things in motion not in a macabre way necessarily. I mean, sometimes it feels a little macabre, right? Cause you're talking about, <laughs> you're talking about your death or talking about your loved one's death. But, but at the same time that, that planning, the getting stuff in order, well, first of all, that's a huge gift. Yes. To give to your family because then they can truly honor you the way that you wanted to be honored. And, and that feels better to them, right? All of a sudden they're like, oh, thank goodness. I can make these choices knowing that this is what my loved one wanted. And I'm, and I'm honoring them in the way they chose to, and not just, you know, wing it. <laughs> well, that, and you know, the people <laughs> that you talk to when they're, when they're going through um, that settlement of an estate process, there's so many, I mean, you know, how many, how many decisions did you have to make after your mom passed? Not as many as after my dad passed away. Oh Lord. That was like, <laughs> I kept thinking, yeah. you know, my husband's a real estate broker. So I'm familiar with these stacks of dead trees. One must sign to buy a house or sell a house or all that. Yeah. And it was the same thing with my dad. It was like, you know, like how much paperwork do I have to fill out for somebody who's gone? It's not like, not like we're purchasing anything or selling anything. It's like, no, just got to fill out all this paperwork for being gone. It was like, oh, yikes. So it was because we'd, 
dealt with their house and we dealt with probably 75% of it, at least with my dad's passing. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, my mom passed away. So pretty much the only thing left to do was um, sell her house. We had rented it out after my dad passed away mm -hmm. to pay for the care home that she was in because the house was paid for free and clear. It had super cheap property taxes, you know, the, well, I ended up spending a lot of money on that house. I had to put in a new HVAC unit and some other crazy stuff, but it was 50 years old when we sold it. Yes. Last year. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't too much of a surprise. So even though we had to sell it the early stages of COVID, it all went pretty smoothly. So, but I think that's because we did all the hard work dealing with the house and stuff with my dad, you know, just like, I still have family photos to go through with my mom's youngest brother. That's one of my biggest regrets with three generations of memory loss on my mom's side of the family is I've got tons of family photos. I have no idea who these people are. Unless my <laughs> uncle can identify them, they're always going to be those strangers. You know, it's like having been a photographer for 30 years, I don't want to throw them away, but I don't know who the heck they are. So. I don't know what we're going to do with them. Yeah. yeah. Tip for everyone listening, write your names on the back of the photos and, and even the approximate year. If you, <laughs> yeah, because it's true. You know, you want to be able to keep these pictures that maybe of your relatives, right? You mm -hmm. usually at least one person in the family is all about the family tree and, and putting that all together and understanding what the history of the family is, but without the information, you know, you're just kind of guessing at that point, right? Yes. Well, I have a really quick, super funny story that everybody will totally appreciate. If you don't appreciate it, well, I don't know what to say for you. <laughs> when we had our photography studio and our photo lab yeah. back in the early 2000s, this family member brought in a very, very old photo album. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of pictures of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. So you can tell oh, wow. it was very old, total documentation on what, you know, and the pictures are literally wallet size. So they're about two mm -hmm. inches by three inches. So they're tiny. So, yeah. you know, as we age, I'm going to get the magnifying glass out to appreciate those, but it documented <laughs> who was in the pictures, what was in the pictures. A lot of it was the damage and the destruction of the city something yeah. that you would expect. And there was one photo in there of the person who had taken all the photos and it said, me, of course. <laughs> Nobody had a clue who me, of course, was. So put your name in there. Uh -huh, <laughs> it feels <right>? really weird. <laughs> but at some point, you know, somebody is not going to remember that so-and-so, that Aaron was the one that took all the family pictures forever. You know, two yeah. generations removed, they might not remember that. So write your name, you know, me, of course. And then in parentheses, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> But I just thought that was the funniest because I'm like, this person will live in infamy as me, of course. Yeah, me, of course. Well, so who is leading the positive death positivity movement? I, I read some stuff about death cafes and yeah, coffin so, clubs. Not interested uh, in a coffin club. That sounds just too <laughs> weird for me. <laughs> that one was definitely different for me too, you know, but it was like people that wanted to kind of design their coffins and, and talk about what they wanted. And, and it was interesting to read because it was the families that went and actually participated in that. They felt like they really had this closeness with their loved ones. And it, and once they had kind of gotten the con conversation of death out of the way, right? It's like, once you, once you kind of get past that piece, then nothing's off the table. Then they felt comfortable talking about all these other topics that they might not otherwise feel comfortable talking about with their family. It was really interesting. It was just like unblocking that one fear that one, you know, death being this block, right? Once you move that out of the way and then everything can just kind of flow. Um, but Caitlin, uh, and I don't know exactly how to say her name. I think it's Doughty, D-O-U-G-H-T-Y. Um, but she is the founder of the Order of the Good Death. And she was the first one that kind of put the, the term death positivity out there um, back in 2013. And then it's just kind of picked up a lot of steam. It's been interesting 
um, to see how many both millennials, but even Gen Z really resonate with that. And I don't know if it's because death just seems so far in the future that they can talk about it without any kind of fear. Makes um, sense. It does. And, and then, you know, you couple that with some of the really traumatic events that, that their generation has already lived through. No kidding. <laughs> First a giant recession and then a pandemic. Right. Sorry, guys. Well, and even, you know, if they're old enough, they lived through uh, the Twin Towers, you know, through 9-11 and and a recession and a pandemic and you know yeah i almost forgot I, about 9 11 my daughter is 29 so she was in fifth grade when that happened and my husband is from new york so we had some personal attachments to that um and so she graduated high school 2009 so that wasn't a great year and then the pandemic so i hope she doesn't have to live through any more because that's enough <laughs> Does she still remember 9-11? Have you guys yeah. had any conversations about it? Yeah. Yeah. Not mostly when the anniversary comes up, we talk about like how she kind of experienced it. Cause I had never been to New York yet. That was supposed to change last mm -hmm. year. <laughs> and oh. I just remember waking, this is well, way back in the old days, waking up to the alarm clock and it was like, oh, an airplane hit the Twin Towers. And I hit the snooze bar thinking, how the hell do you not miss the building? It's kind of big. <laughs> and and I, I'm like, duh. Like, what do you fly with your eyes closed? Come on. Like, what the heck? Yeah. And then I hit the snooze, when the snooze bar, yeah, I hit the snooze bar. So when it came back on, uh -huh. the tone had changed dramatically from, you know, kind of chirpy news alert to, uh, this is really serious. And I flip on the TV and there's smoke coming out. And, and I asked my husband, like, how the hell they put out a fire? Like the 110th floor. And he tells me all about the, his father actually ran the phone lines into the twin towers back mm -hmm. in the seventies when it was being built. And okay. so there was all this like family connection and he brought out pictures that he had taken the last time he'd been, blah 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 and it was just it was just a really interesting day because he had jury duty and so mm -hmm. he's like do i go and i'm like we probably should and they go and they're like yeah none of you guys need to stay it was just so <laughs> strange you know it was just and being in california you know we're like the opposite side of the coast and it's like mm -hmm. oh yeah that's a thing that's happening and you kind of sort of go about your day but you kind of don't it's just you know that's insane. So, so when you do make it to New York, you have to go if it's still playing. There's a musical called Come From Away. Oh, I had not heard of that one. And and it tells the story of this little town called Gander that's um, in Newfoundland. So all the planes that were in the air when 9-11 happened, of course, they, they couldn't land them in the U.S. because the airspace had been closed. So they landed 38 planes, like 7,000 people in this little tiny town of Gander in Newfoundland. And it's just, it, it's an amazing, amazing story. And I highly recommend. And, and the music is fantastic. So it's a, it's a musical on Broadway. Too. I will definitely. My daughter says she recommends it too. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely have to check that out. But we we had friends that were in the air. We had friends that were overseas. I mean, it was just kind of like, oh well, you know, stuff happens. <laughs> like, yeah. See you when you see you. You know, it's just you know, it's just it's amazing we can live through a lot of that stuff and then just kind of laugh about it later. But mm -hmm. going back to the death positivity, it's like. I don't know why it's such a taboo type subject because when you were taught, we were talking about the yeah. coffin clubs, which still sound, <laughs> I don't know if I like that term <laughs> and nobody in my family. I mean, we're all like, my parents were cremated. Um, there's that option to be like balled up and turned into a tree that kind of appeals to, you know, us environmentalists out here in yeah. California. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I can picture like once you get past the, well, yeah, we are going to die at some point. I can picture my goofball family like climbing in and being goofy. <laughs> just, it'd almost be a circus. It would probably be embarrassing because we would probably not be very uh, proper. <laughs> but you see, know, then it's but, like. But that's part of the whole thing, right? Everybody celebrates life and celebrates death, death in a different way. And that's okay. You know, everybody has their own path to 
understanding what they, you know, and I think being lighthearted about it, like you're talking about, that's, there's such validity to that. And and that's, that's healing for you and for your family. And, and that's what it's all about, right? I think so. I've, my personal belief, and this was pretty much the case with my mom. I mean, obviously she had advanced Alzheimer's. She fell and broke her leg. I did not assume that that would be the end and it was and i had accepted that she would probably not walk anymore because she wouldn't do the physical therapy that she would need either yeah. with the reparative surgery or without it mm -hmm. so i was not thinking i was thinking on the positive side like okay she'll be in a wheelchair i'll be able to take her out to the park and we can get from point a to point b in like a reasonable amount of time instead of taking 15 minutes to walk from the car to the park <laughs> and uh, I was like on the positive end of that. And when she, they, the care home called and said, well, you know, she's not doing so great. We think she did. We think she'd, uh, it, you know, do well with a visit from you, which translates to, holy crap, we think this gal's going to go. We better call the family because this was right at the start of the pandemic so that we, I hadn't been there for two weeks because they closed it. Mm -hmm. And then I saw her and I'm like, oh yeah, this, yeah, we won't be going anywhere in a wheelchair. So it was surprising to me how I, I don't want to say devastated i mean part of me felt devastated because it was like i wasn't expecting it then was expecting it and i was i thought i was prepared for it and for the most part i think if we hadn't had the pandemic grief process would have been fairly reasonable but like my dad died i had to deal with my mother i had to deal with his mother i had to deal with the estate and it's just like there was there wasn't more than a couple of days to just basically say i'm not making decisions just bring me food pick out some clothes to wear i'm just not making decisions that's how i was for two days after he died and then it was like okay back to business now and that's yeah. how it basically was with my mom <laughs> yeah you know it's like well you can't have a funeral you can't have a celebration of life so well just go back to doing what you were doing before she died it was just like uh the pandemic did change that. And mm -hmm. there was a couple of times late last year and early this year where it was like, you, I could just tell it was like all of a sudden all this crap would come up and it was like, well, I thought I dealt with that pretty well, but apparently not came back up at, at me. Yeah. So I've, and I've heard, have you ever heard the, the grief uh, with the ball in the box theory? No. So um, I've, I've seen this theory a couple of times and I, and I think it does such a great job at talking about grief. And so if you imagine a, a box, right, and, and a ball inside and there's a button and, the, and that's like your grief button. So every time the ball hits the button, then you're like overcome with grief. And, and when the event first happens, like the ball is huge. It's just about touching all the sides you know, and, and so it's your, your grief buttons getting hit constantly. Right. And then over time, like the ball starts to get a little bit smaller and now it's just kind of bouncing around inside this, this box, but you're still, it'll just kind of, you know, come and smack you at, when, when you don't expect it. And, and then as the great, you know, time goes by, the ball gets a little smaller. Well, now you really don't know when to expect it because it's just going to show up sometimes, you know? <laughs> yes, and like when you're frustrated with your, well, my wet, you know that the website got malware attached to it, yeah, which caused all kinds of problems. The funniest of which, and I'm going to say funny because it's so frustrating because it's so <laughs> stupid. My home Wi-Fi security VPN network, whatever you call yeah. it because my website got blacklisted every time I try to pull it up on my computer, it kicks me out. So it's blocking me from my own website in my own house. <sighs> oh, Jennifer, that's awful. <laughs> I think we have a fix, but it's been, you know, it's just like one of those things. It's like, really? It's like, do I have to go? I can't even go to the library and take my laptop. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> so there was there's the entire network at the library you know no big thing <laughs> yeah it's like well it's just it's the the company that um has the equipment that you know i don't know exactly what it's called but it's basically so that people can't do nasty stuff through our own home network mm -hmm. it's what's block it the website's fine 
my, we can get on it on our phones. I can use the hotspot on my phone to run my computer, which mm -hmm. works and then doesn't work. And then comes, it's just like, oh my God. But when all that happened, you know, it got to the point where you're like, I have done so much. I'm just done. I'm like, I give up I'm just quitting. <laughs> you know. And then you just, and then like the oh. tidal wave of negative emotions comes over you. And it's like, okay, well that, mm, thought I dealt with this stuff. Okay. I guess it's coming back. <laughs> Yeah. But that kind of leads me into my other question is like caregiving is it's like, it kind of sucks you into a big deep hole and yeah. you're doing everything you can to, to protect them, to keep them safe and to, you know, mm -hmm. help them navigate through every day. I think a lot of times caregivers get so caught up in caregiving that they don't, mm -hmm that they, they start doing things. And I know some people that have, that this applies to, they do mm -hmm. everything they can to prevent them from dying. It's like, did you really think yeah. your spouse wants to be like this for an extra six months? Or maybe we should have let them go back then. So how should like, why should a caregiver think about and embrace this death positivity? It's like, not like we didn't have enough things to think about. <laughs> Well, Try to keep them alive here. Now you're talking about death again. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole concept, right, is not that grief doesn't accompany death because it does, right? It's part of it. it it's, it's the idea of, of removing some of the anxiety because we have enough anxiety in our lives. We have plenty of things to worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. So it, it's saying, okay, if we come to terms with, with death and we're, we're accepting this, you know, and, and not, not letting it be wrapped in that fear and anxiety. Right. Because, mm -hmm. because truly if you're, if you're showing up every day as a caregiver from a place of love and from a place of um, protection, right. As opposed to a place of what could go wrong, you know, all the fear, all the anxiety, all that kind of stuff. Right you guys are already doing the hardest work that there is to do like, you know, the, the hardest work. And it's, it's not just the physical piece, but it's that emotional labor. And, and I understand it's absolutely a labor of love, right? So, mm -hmm. so as much of the fear and anxiety that you can remove from that, it, it just makes for a better experience for everyone, right? And it allows you to move that block that we talked about out of the way and, and allow the conversation to flow better, allows you to have those conversations about, you know, what, what do you want mom or dad or, you know, whoever you're caring for um, so that I can honor you in the way that, that you want to be honored, you know, not saying that, death is going to happen tomorrow and hopefully it won't. Right. But it's like, Hey, th this is a conversation that we can have and, and bring it from a place of love. And it's because I love you, Jennifer, and care about you that I want to have this conversation and understand what your wishes are, because I want to be able to, to remember you both now and, and in the future and know that I honored all of your wishes. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. I I've wanted to do for my mom's celebration of life, a dessert buffet. Cause she was a complete oh, sugar. Fan. Yes. And of course, my grandma know, would love that too. I'll tell you what. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my family knows like I am not, I don't wear black. I don't have any black, anything except workout pants at wow. this point. Cause whatever I have those black, went away during the COVID, <laughs> but it's like, I want people to show up to my celebration of life. My favorite color is pink, but I like colors. So show up in pinks and purples and greens and reds and whatever rainbow. I don't care. Just don't come in black. Yeah. If you come in black, I probably will haunt you. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it's like, cause to me, that's me. It's like, don't show up in black, especially if I live as long as my paternal grandmother. If I live to be over a hundred, which, you know, knock wood, as long as my brain is still intact, like party on. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like my husband and I and my daughter and almost son-in-law, I feel like we've had those conversations. I don't know why, maybe because 
when somebody's got Alzheimer's for 20 years, it does become a topic eventually. And I don't know. My daughter's favorite ha- um, holiday is Halloween. So there's <laughs> probably some morbid sense of weird sense of humor. My dad's hospice company did tell me they appreciated my morbid sense of humor, which I wasn't <laughs> sure if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> I would absolutely take that as a compliment. I did, but it was kind of like, okay, these are the people that are dealing with people who are dying and they're appreciating my morbid sense of humor. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but you know, well, it just had I to do. You have to find the joy where you can, right? Yeah. And he was, he was kind of rough at the end. He was, he didn't not his, uh, he had kidney failure, which the toxins from the kidneys not doing their job basically poisoned the brain. So he had memory loss. So I had two people and, you know, both my parents had no minds. It was lovely, but he, he didn't know he was dying. And so he was a real pain in the ass and he was verbally abusive. So it wasn't very fun, but what was funny is he was being really obnoxious to one of the caregivers and I, don't know, I I said something to him and he just it growl snapped. This was really nasty to me. And I just left the room because it's like, well, there's no sense in like, you know, getting into an argument with him because that's not going to make me feel better now or later. And so my husband are leaning on the kitchen counter with our heads together talking. And my mom pokes her head in between us and goes, he's being an ass. Feel free to go in there and tell him to drop dead. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, she only knew what she was saying. And it was really hard not to laugh hysterically. Right. And just cringe completely. It was just like one of those most bizarre moments I'll probably remember for the rest of my life. (laughs) So I know you have another meeting. Hopefully the internet will not kick us off again. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hopefully. Sometimes technology does not like us. Is there anything you want to leave people on this top thinking about on this topic you know yeah i mean i i think it's really i i think that if you open the lines of communication right and and i feel like any time because to me one of my favorite sayings is that the word emotion is like almost all the word emotion is the word motion and so emotions are meant to move through us right both positive and negative emotions. And and when you try to block that, when you try to stop that, it causes all kinds of issues in your life. So, so opening those lines of communication and then you, you can create this positivity around death that allows you to live your life more fully. And, and that, that's, I think what, what I would leave people with is so many times we get so, uncomfortable or afraid or anxious about thinking about death, about thinking about those conversations that we just don't have the conversations at all. And then people are left scrambling and they don't know what you wanted. They don't know (laughs) how to honor you in the way that you wanted to. Um, You know, part of the reason we created easy now was to give people a place to put all this stuff. But the biggest piece is having these conversations and, and being able to communicate in a loving and and open way. And, And I think that's truly what, what death positivity is all about. Well, that sounds like a perfect spot to end and say, thank you. And I hope everybody enjoyed this strange, happy conversation on death. (laughs) Jennifer, thank you. It's been a delight. And uh, thanks so much. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.